is the yeah. bit, isn't it? It's, it, it? That confuses me. It's like, do we choose to come here to, to get this sorted out, or is this just? It just seems a little unfair, doesn't it? That that you know, we we seem to be here, and there's this parasite messing up our experience. And you know, I know in my own life, the times that I've made major changes, it was like it became more painful not to change than to change. That was when I made made big changes. You know, it's, it's this whole ridiculous narrative of, it's you know, it's an unsafe world. There's not enough for you. It's scary. Everyone's out to get you. And and clearly, the old civilization was completely the opposite to that. It was all about empowerment, like literally. Cosmic I resonance. I think they called that one. Or cosmic something. resonance. That's a better yep. name. Uh, real science. You can actually produce free electricity, and this is part of what Tesla was doing is the differential between the top of the spire to the ground actually creates an electrical differential that you then connect to another wire that goes into the ground, your grounding, put that into the, the third phase in your circuit, and then you have a bell ringing circuit and that actually produces plasma electricity out of the air. Like you're, it's real technology. These things actually function producing electricity. It, it's crazy. The movies are the truth and the news is the lies. They've completely flipped it. You know, when you look at everything with new eyes and you come across information like she was born into a very wealthy family with elite connections, you know, it means something very different now to me than it would have even a few years ago. And it's our free will that they've really also messed with because we've been lied to and we react based on lies. And just getting their independence and they in, end up in civil wars for 20, 30 years um, happens a lot. Because we keep choosing to pick up the gun and use it on ourselves instead of building and uniting and accepting that we are one people, one spirit, one harmony on one plane that together, united, can achieve anything we dream of. So do you want to, you know, wake up or do you want to just keep going along because it's, it's a change is too difficult? And then give them pieces of information that they will then pursue themselves and look into and then they'll wake themselves up. I was going to mention it's the whole red pill, blue pill of the Matrix. I mean, that of the movie. And you can consider that movie as a documentary um, because they're telling us something about what's happening here. So do you want to, you know, wake up or do you want to just keep going along because it's, it's, it's change is too difficult? Wake up. All right, we're live. There's no Paul Cook, there's no Campbell, but there is Michelle Gibson. We are still live on uh, Campbell's channel, though, and uh, Paul might be popping in. Sadly, he had something come up, but we will be back with him next Friday at this time, hopefully. Michelle, how are you today, sister? I'm doing great. This is actually a great time for me. It's middle of the day where I live. And apparently it's two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning where Campbell is. And uh, so we're trying to work out this uh, scheduling across time zone things. So bear with us, but we'll have a good show today. Indeed. And who knows, we might just wake Campbell from his sleep and have him uh, sleepwalk into here. But uh, <laughs> if you're sleeping in Australia, that's okay. You'll catch the replay. Um, quite uh, a lot of topics today to uh, discuss. Um, I guess I'll kind of let you take it away. Did you want to present a uh, screen or what should we do here? Sounds good to me. Um, because we're going to cover a number of topics um, that are interrelated. And I want to stop start with geopolymer, which was the topic that we were going to go over with Paul today, as well as some others. And we're going to go over it again with Paul next time, because I know what a geopolymer is. I know um, that we're surrounded by geopolymers that we think are natural formations, and they're actually man-made, which is what a geopolymer is. And um, I think Paul, with his work 
is probably far more knowledgeable on that particular subject, um, but I can go into a little bit and show some recent examples from work that I've done and then uh, talk a little bit about my own uh, background in terms of how there we I go. Even... We've got Paul with us now. Hey, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Right, trying to bait him in, trying to get, I know he might be watching, so we're just trying to bait him in. He's got the link. Okay, okay, great. So um, I want to talk a little bit about how I got into this because, you know, basically it's things that I started becoming aware of when I was very young, but it was long before I was conscious of the information I'm sharing now. It was experiences that I had, places I went, things that I read. And, and just a lifelong fascination, I would say, in possibly hidden history, but megalithic structures. And I would say it was megaliths that really got my interest because you see the same things in South America that you see in Turkey. Just two examples, I mean, the exact same things. And so that was my entry point. And up until a few years ago, there really wasn't that much information on anything outside of the conventional narrative. You know, they really can't explain how they did it, but <laughs> right <laughs> how they did it. And, you know, they come up with crazy explanations. And so just kicking off with the geopolymer topic just a little bit. Um, what I do is if I don't know something, I look it up. So this morning I was just looking around for geopolymer, you know, because like I said, I don't have extensive knowledge, but I have enough knowledge to know that we're looking at something that's not naturally made. And so I found uh, an abstract from an article about megalithic blocks in Pumapunku and Tijuana, Tijuana, Tijuanaku, Bolivia. And for anybody that's interested in hidden history, Graham Hancock's book, Fingerprints of the Gods, was probably a starting point for a lot of people. I know. I know it, <laughs> it, was a, it was a major thing early on when I first really started looking into this more deeply. Um, I read his book and it's like, ah, yeah, <laughs> how, how is this possible? And so he's talking about um, Tiwanaku. I think towards the beginning of that in this whole region in Peru and Bolivia um, and or in Bolivia, I've been to um, Lake Titicaca in Peru. I uh, traveled to Cusco and oh, I'm jealous. what can I say? <laughs> I was we able to go travel there again <laughs> together someday. <laughs> like we will do it. We will meet Graham Hancock or Brian Forrester there one day. I just, I almost went on um, a trip with Hugh Newman and, and Brian Forster with Megalithomania many, many years ago. Nice. And it was in around 2012, 2013. I was signed up for it and everything. And I just, I, things in my life didn't work out to where I could go on it, but I was signed up for it. I was going to go. Um, and we that was- We still are. We <laughs> still are. But that was before I started waking up to my own um, knowledge to share or information that that came to me um and i stood on a lot of shoulders in coming to the perspective that i have and that included graham hancock and hugh newman and um uh robert boval who wrote the book the orion theory about how the belt stars were reflected in the pyramids. Um, those were all guides on my journey. Um, but I had a particular stream, shall we say, to bring in. And so I was, I would call myself aware, but not awake until starting around 2007. And up until about 2007, I, I didn't have the bigger picture, but I didn't trust the narrative either. I knew there, there, there was more. I just didn't know what it was. And it just seems like that I have memories throughout my life that have things that were like out of place. I would see it. I'm go, well, that's interesting or that's weird. And 
and so I was aware that way, but it wasn't till about 2007, and I had relocated to Fairbanks, Alaska, where I had lived previously. Um, I got out of a bad relationship, and it's like, okay, it was not a good place for me. <laughs> and had I... All the way to Alaska to escape, right? Well, it was where I ended up going back. And honestly, since that moment I made that decision, it's like it's been straight up. <laughs> and it was like I, I traveled from the East Coast, um, of actually Canada at that time. And it's a long story, but I was in Nova Scotia <laughs> when I made the breakaway. Um, and I went back to where I lived in Fairbanks between um, 94 and 99. And so I lived in Fairbanks between 2006 and 2012. And it was like when I made that decision to take back control of my life, because my, my husband had died and I was just kind of giving my power away to other people, you know, thinking, you know, it was my time. Well, I ended up in a really bad relationship. <laughs> and so it was like, when you have a mission, the universe conspires to help you. And that's, that's what happened with me. It's like the moment I made that choice, it's like, okay, I'm going to Fairbanks. Everything worked together to get me to where I am today. And so I, I returned to Fairbanks in 2006. And I had a group of friends in Fairbanks um, that kind of were into shamanic practices and things like that, you know, healing and and so forth. And one of the ladies was familiar with Drunvalo Mikhelzadek's work, for anybody that might have heard of him. And it was through my friend that I learned about sacred geometry. And I went to a Flower of Life workshop. And this is a critical piece of information. <laughs> because everything is based on sacred geometry in our bodies, in our world, in the universe. It's a creation pattern of the universe with the flower of life and you find the platonic solids within that. So I learned about that around 2007. And other things as well. I started waking up to unity consciousness and I read Greg Braden and other guides, you know, that's where I, I learned about Graham Hancock's work and Robert Boval's work and so on and so forth. Um, and then I was, I found Megalithomania on YouTube around 2010, 2011. And I started watching those and we're talking about Megalis. And I just couldn't get enough information you know, if it's Me had too, right? history on it, it's like, okay, that's what I'm looking for. Um, days when and I, days and weeks of watching <laughs> Megalithic Mania, right? Like when it was first coming out, it's like they... And I was, they so I'm watching it, my tongue's hanging my out of my mouth. I'm going, who did this? How, what's going on here? So um, I moved from Fairbanks to Oklahoma City around 2012. So I was awake. I would call myself awake by 2012. I was following the end of the Mayan calendar, you know, really absorbed and interested in that, reading books around that. Um, John Major Jenkins, for anybody that's heard of him, um, uh, Barbara Han Clow, others. I just, I just wanted, to find, wanted to know what's going on. And then when I moved to Oklahoma City, um, I started going to a Unity Spiritual Life Center there. And I met a Moorish American man. And he just kind of attached himself to me. He didn't say much at all. Um, but we became friends. And then with two other ladies in the church, we would go traveling through the area of Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana. And it was during that time that I started to see the ancient civilization and the landscape around me um earthworks and you know things going on and it was really starting and seeing megaliths just laying around on the sidewalks and right. and 
And once, so once you see it, you can't unsee it. See it. And once I mean, your eye opens up for the first time to this new reality, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. You know, and that's why there aren't ever too many people doing this work because once you see it, and if you have the skills and abilities to, you know, start your own YouTube channel or blog or whatever, um, you know, it's it's a, it's a, we are it. <laughs> you know, we're the ones we've been waiting for, and. Um, you know, and I think we all have pieces of the puzzle to bring and we're, you know, kind of, going, well, this might fit here. You know, they've, they've just given us so much misinformation and disinformation that um, it's like, you know, we've been lied to completely. So we just have to go with what we're guided to. And um, I want to give a shout out to two smaller channels I've talked about on the last live stream I did with you um, that are doing phenomenal work. And one is uh, Deeper Conversations with Chad and then Stephanie McPeak Peterson are doing fantastic work. And we're all, um, and they're smaller channels. Um, you know, people just saying, okay, yes, I, I see this. This is what I feel motivated to do. And I know there's a lot of people that are doing that. I mean, I get feedback from people that it's um helping you know, just take your camera <laughs> you know and starting to say yeah well maybe you know that that they does look like it's engraved and the building's much older yeah, or it, you know it does look like there's <laughs> there used to be a uh you know the the extra number to make the like 19 instead of 963 it would read 1963 but the you know the first number is looks a little sketchy um you know there's just you can't have too many people doing this and it, it's just really important and i know when i got the pieces of the puzzle that i'm sharing it was like okay i got this information to give back to the collective awareness and so i want to go back to my moorish american friend um he didn't he demonstrated the Moors to me. He didn't, when when he would send me information like Moorish teachers, it was usually when it was in response to something I said or did that was insensitive. And I didn't mean to be, it's out of ignorance. And it's out of ignorance for all of us because we have no knowledge of the Moors and this ancient civilization. And so, um, one time he came over, we were having a, um, my 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 two lady friends and my friend Osiris, we would meet at each other's places and watch uh, like secret space program <laughs> type things or other hidden history elements. And right? but like there's golden <laughs> nuggets in all of it. And he wore a t-shirt, and my friend Anne said, "Osiris, why are you wearing an Illuminati t-shirt?" Because it was it's. <laughs> it looks like the great seal of the United States with the, you know, the pyramid and the eye and all of that stuff. And I'm like, yo, Cyrus, why are you wearing an Illuminati t-shirt? Didn't Illuminati say anything. Didn't say anything. And I got an email the next morning that was hot. And for Osiris, that was really hard to get to that point because just a sweet, loving, ancient soul. And so <laughs> if you look up the great seal of the moors which is what his t-shirt had on it 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 looks like the the symbol on the back of the uh us one dollar bill with, with or novus ordo Secorum underneath it. It, it it was taken from the great seal of the moors and so the controllers have just kind of inverted all of the symbolism that was originally part of this original civilization and they just separated it out and um and turned it into different things whereas at one part at one point in time it was all part of the same thing and so um so when i got that hot email from osiris he would send me links for information about the moors and moorish teachers and so I was open to it because, you know, I just wanted to know the truth. And so what can, what comes from that, and the word more actually relates back to Mu, ancient Mu, Moors, 
M-U apostrophe U-R-S. And it, it was like a continuous civilization from ancient Lemuria or Mu to through Atlantis up until relatively recently. And I will give examples of that. Um, but the controllers, when they did their reset, they separated everything out and then they turned it into organized religions and conflict um, right and based on skill, based on religion, based on skin color. And they made us, they turned, turned that around so that we would fight each other instead of the people that are actually behind what's taken place that stole the legacy of the original civilization and claimed it as their own. And that's where you get Western Freemason, Freemasonry and all of that. And, you know, there's right. different and societies. Just, this is just a quick search on DuckDuckGo of Moorish America. And you can see all of these original uh, Moorish esoteric symbols and cultural symbols that the Freemasons, the Illuminati, whatever you want to call them all, have subverted and um, perverted these symbols, just like uh, they did with the swastika in uh, Nazi Germany and stuff like that, destroying these sacred geometries and uh, symbols and cultures. Right. And then they've proceeded to destroy just about everything. You know, there's there's a lot of infrastructure still standing, but there's a lot more that has been destroyed you know, with the World Fairs and a lot of other examples. I mean, even with modern construction projects, if it's not protected in a park and you want to build a road or housing development, it's all it all gets destroyed and torn up and their earthworks and things like that. And I woke up to this in Oklahoma. So, you know, I'm seeing firsthand how that took place. And it was like, a lot of it was experiential. And I know Paul does a lot of field work. Um, when you go out into the field and do research work in situ, you get a lot more information than you just get looking at the internet. You know, and if that's all you have, you know, it's better than nothing. But if you go out and do your own research work, you start to get more pieces of the puzzle. And this is something because it's been removed from our narrative. It's been removed from literature. Books have been rewritten. And we've been getting up you know, in this false historical narrative. The only way it can come back is through motivated individuals act on their impulses and um you know my 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 sense is that this is information that's just you know dying to come back in because without it we don't know who we are where we came from um and it's 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 so important to um be open and and new information comes in when you when you let go of your ideas about what's going on here, because I can tell you, we've been lied to um, off the charts. It's just not even, humanity has been treated so badly. And they are, you know, the goal of these beings um, is to take control of our souls. And our souls are directly connected to our creator. And so they want that because they don't have that. They can only get that through us. And they can only get it through us if we give it to them. And that's why waking up to information is um, is is really important. All right. And if you don't have an open mind, you'll never see uh, the universe that is everywhere but hidden in plain sight you have to unveil your third eye to be able to see um what has been hidden from us and uh thank you so much dave's waffle house and lynn jones 250 for the super chats and support it is appreciated and and and, and there's an important point um that the beings that are doing this hate the creator, they hate us, but they're jealous of us, and they're jealous of the creator. And they tell us 
that in books like Paradise Lost and other things as well. They've told us they have to tell us. But they've also given us this virtual reality world that we live in, that we live vicariously through movies and we're distracted by video games and other things, you know, so they've given us all kinds of distractions to keep us from focusing on our connection to our creator. And, um, and they want that. I mean, they want human creativity and human energy and, um, they feed off of suffering almost. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They do. They, they uh, completely, you know, at the beginning, when you talk about, we talked about the matrix before the movie, um, that's what it's, it's a documentary. I mean, that's what's going on. And it's hard for us to see it because we think we're just going to um, to a movie to be entertained. And so, no, they have to tell us what they're doing, but they don't tell us that they're telling us. So, um, and just important things to keep in mind because I, I firmly believe that they're not gonna get away with what they've done and that we're living in remarkable times. And part of it is the Great Awakening, you know, and that's what the grassroots um, YouTubers are in this community are are doing is, you know, helping that process. Right. The it's narrative the is officially falling. Like um, I was on, I hopped on the end of my friend, uh, the alien scientist stream yesterday, and uh, he was more of like a, uh, well, like recognizes a lot of the conspiracies, but at the same time also takes a lot of the science sides, but was against uh, the whole jabby jab and uh, on the science of like, hey, this was like a leak from somewhere or an intentional man-made thing from the get-go. But uh, it was on Ben Weinstein um, uh, channel uh, talking about UFOs the day before. And all of a sudden, we had someone join from the hospital bed who had suffered from a stroke or a seizure, another seizure from getting the jabby jabs and just showing that, uh, you know, documenting how bad they've messed up with this narrative and that the truth is now crumbling and shattering their propaganda and their divide and conquer, and that it is this great awakening and that's why all of these beautiful souls are here with us 200 almost 200 people watching right now thank you everybody for being here and uh you know it just keeps accelerating more and more and uh there's no going back and it's a great reset of the golden opportunity for a new golden age of enlightenment and it does not have to always be the doom and gloom don't uh, let it be that self-fulfilling negative prophecy. Work together to build your community up. Right. And uh, I, I was awake enough that up to about 2016, I was pretty concerned because I knew how dark the dark was by that time. That was what I learned between 2012 and 2016, in addition to uncovering the information that my research is based on. And so, um, and once I found that, I started doing my my own line of research based on the new America, the uh, North American star tetrahedron that I found by connecting cities and places in North America that lined up in lines. And I found what's called a star tetrahedron. It's best known as like the Star of David or the Merkaba um, with Edmonton, the northern apex. Right, and, that's above me. And, and, and Merida, Mexico, the bottom apex. So it's basically two triangles or tetrahedrons that one's going up and one's going down. And it's a significant shape because it's like um, the creation shape of, of the universe. It's, it's like vortex-based mathematics and, and the torus and you know energy cycling up through us as we breathe and back Metatron down and up cube, and down and you know metatron's cube so it's it's all based on that and and so um you know forgive me if i'm mambling here a little bit but there's a lot of pieces here so um let's take that back to the megaliths which was my beginning point and um i looked up geopolymer and i found this article about um megalithic blocks in tiwanaku so 
I started on this a while back and got sidetracked. Um, but basically, um, the conventional theories suggest Are you that, wanting to share screen, Michelle? Or? Uh, no, no, I've got this. Uh, I, I printed okay. it out. Um, the conventional theories suggest that the constituent stone blocks were cut from quarries, sometimes remotely located, accurately dressed and lifted into position. So that's the only way we can even conceive that these giant stone blocks were came into being and placed. I suggest that there are technologies that we've long forgotten about how the ancient builders built these stone structures. And, um, and that's where the geopolymer comes in, which is like, um, like an ancient um, combination of minerals within these blocks. And so the sandstone in Pumapunku and Tiwanaku in Bolivia um, consists of sandstone grains from a particular site cemented with an amorphous ferrocyolate geopolymer matrix formed by human intervention and you know addition of alkaline salt from another place in the in the area. So these big stone blocks were were man-made. And particularly in Peru, we're talking massive massive megaliths. And then you also have, um, like at Sacsayhuaman, um, you have these massive stone blocks that are perfectly fitted together. And, you know, some of them have angles. <laughs> it's like a, it's a literally jigsaw lost. puzzle. They're earthquake proof. They've survived so much. And like, um, as you're telling your story, I'm just getting this so so many parallels for my own timeline and understanding these things and like seeing them and like there, there's no other way other than geopolymer. So I want to give some examples of some things that I've studied and um, this was I'm going to go ahead and uh, present. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So this is from my most recent video upload last night, and it's part two of a two-part series that I actually did about three years ago. And I, I put it together. I had referenced it in a conversation that I had with Deeper Conversations with Chad, and so it kind of prompted me to go ahead and do it. And you know, three years later, there's a lot of other things that are are starting to connect about this, but. Um, this was following a long distance alignment that I had found. It's one of the first alignments that I found after I um, found the North American star tetrahedron and extended the lines and wrote down the places that were lining up in lines and circles. And so that was about 1920 spreadsheet pages that started me on this journey. And where my initial research began was going and looking at these alignments and looking at each place. And then from that process, I started to get bigger pieces of the picture coming into focus because I was seeing how the controllers came in and took them over. And I found star ports all over the place. It was like when the colonial area first era first started, they were going right for the star forts. And you know, the whole narrative that we're given about how the Spanish colonized the Philippines and the Indies and you know England and Britain colonized North America and other places um, had a lot to do with these grid lines. And so I just want to give this example about the Lena River pillars because um, when I first tracked this alignment that this series is based on, um, I was just looking at what was there and around Tixie what came up was the Lena River pillars. And um, when you look at it from this view, you can kind of see that it looks like masonry. Right, big time. <laughs> you know, you don't see it as much from this and they can kind of get away with calling all of this kind of thing a natural feature. But um, we're, this is findable if you look for it in a search. It's got alternating layers of limestone, moral stone, dolomite, and slate. And how is that possible? The alternating layers of those three, it's just like, 
I have taken geology and it just, it's so frustrating because it's like, no, it's all, it's impossible what you guys are claiming. And then they even draw it that everything is all brick shaped in their textbooks. Like, oh yeah, nature just makes everything out of blocks. No, no, it doesn't. Right. And I've got other examples along this alignment of, of places that look like this. Um, but the only explanation that we're given is that it's natural. That's it. You know, they go through the whole, the, you know, ice ages and a hundred million thousand years ago. And, and, you know, these things were formed by the advancing and retreating of glaciers. And they have explanations for anywhere else in the world is called a dolmen, but in North America it's called a glacial erratic. And you have one right. big, huge, <laughs> big, huge boulder sitting on top of like three or four little ones. Um, <laughs> You know, they they've given us this whole false narrative with um, you know to explain all of this man-made stuff as as natural, and you know they're pretty consistent about it. No other explanation given, and um, that was in uh, the picture I just showed was in Russia near Tixi. And there's a lot of them up in that area all throughout there it's it's crazy how many really and the scale of them and that they're also in uh, north america too like in montana megalis and the alberta ones that i'm going to be going to check out very soon and it seems almost like those are leftovers from the time of titans or giants or something one size larger and where the atlanteans maybe uh, a more giant uh, human than what we are today, even. I, you know, it's who knows. Yeah, and you know, the, the examples I give are just like the tip of the iceberg. There's just so much everywhere um, that it's mind-boggling. Uh, that particular alignment that I just showed goes down through um, Alberta, you know, Yukon Territory, Alaska, Manitoba. Uh, Ontario, and um, the, the White Horse Canyon, I don't want to say it's the Miles Canyon in White Horse, uh, has similar looking rock features as does the Wilmette Canyon, which is in Ontario, around that area. So, um, you know, again, the only explanation we're given, it's, it's natural, and this is how it happened, and you know, we were talking about megaliths lying around all over the place. We just, people just walk right on by it because they, they're not tuned into it. And it's just, you know, this perfectly cut and shaped megalithic stone. They're all over, you know, where I was living in Oklahoma City. They're all over where I live in Arizona, you know, in front of houses, in front of stores. Um, there's a pile of them about two or 300 yards. I'm not sure how many meters that is from where I live. <laughs> Some of them with drill holes, you know, <laughs> just laying around. Um, we don't see them for what they are because we've never been told that. And, you know, perceptually, um, one of the images that I like to use is a picture of the, you know, the all, like all seeing eye or something. It says, obey, we control your perception. Well, that's how they've done it. Yeah. They, <laughs> completely, removed, everything in plain sight. <laughs> completely removed it from our awareness and then they give it back to us in movies. <laughs> and we call it pareidolia, right? You're just pareidolia it up. You're just paranoid pareidolia. Don't trust your instincts or the fact that those are faces looking back at you. No, no. Yeah. So we're kind of moving into the alchemy area of yours because I'm going to now show uh, another video I did, uh, and this was also several years ago, because after I was tracking these alignments, I started to have this collection of, of places like what I'm going to show you. And so, again, things that we see as natural features have solstice alignments right <laughs> exactly like sorry so, nature is not gonna do that so how that happened you know winter this is a i want to say it's 
during the winter solstice in December and January that the light comes through Keyhole Arch perfectly at Pfeffer, Pfeiffer Beach at Big Sur in California. Like maybe in it, Middle Earth that will happen naturally, but uh, not in this Earth. So I'm just going to give some examples to show that this isn't just buildings, and I'm going to go into that, but this goes back to what we would call ancient and what we see as natural features in the landscape. But you've got things like this going on. And, and this was a um, blog post and video I put together several years ago called Ancient and Modern Evidence for the Perfect Alignment of Heaven and Earth Worldwide. And, you know, this is more going to show that everything is in perfect alignment with the, with the heavens all over the earth. And the civilization was in perfect alignment with each other, with different places. And um, you, you just have to read between the lines a lot when it comes to finding this, but you also have to um, have the right paradigm. And if you go with everything being random and disconnected, it just it falls apart. It doesn't make sense. And so a lot of good research has been done, um, but it's really important to, to, let's just say, see the big picture of what I'm calling an ancient civilization, a Moorish civilization that was, you know, in perfect alignment geometrically and in, in all the other ways. I don't see this as a warlike civilization at all. I don't think it even would have been possible to have this level of of integration. And I'll give you more examples. I'm not just talking out of my butt. Oh, I, I know. Like that I've you're just complimenting so many that I have also given that it's, it's the the level of macro terraforming involved in each one of these examples you're showing is just astounding. So this is coming up in Kansas and it's it's actually called the Monument National Monument Rocks National Natural Landmark, otherwise known as the Chalk Pyramids in Gove County, Kansas, where you can see another solar alignment at these places. Like those are archways built for purposes of solar alignments. Right. And that's what they were. That's why they were doing it. It was for lining everything up. Perfect balance. This was a highly sophisticated civilization and higher consciousness. The people that lived there knew what they were there for. They weren't unsure where they came from or what they were supposed to be doing there. Um, they knew what they were there for. They were you know, building this beautiful civilization and they were reconnecting with their creator. And so that was, that was what was going on. It, you know, <laughs> they weren't fighting each other. They weren't um, anything. They were creating beauty and harmony. Everything and then harmony, right? We're able to build the peace in heaven on earth. And then you know, great evil saw an opportunity to come in and crash the party, and boy, did they ever. <laughs> boy, did they ever. So right. um, let me give you some more examples. Um, there's another one in England here. About a year or so ago, when I changed my WordPress plan, I ended up losing some photos from some of my earlier videos or earlier blog posts. but. Um, most of them are still in here. Dirtle Door near Lulworth, England in Dorset also has the same kind of winter solstice alignment going on. Um, so these arches, um, it all, it's all about connecting what's going on in the heavens with the earth. As above, so below. And nature doesn't do this naturally. And then you have things like this um, at Arches National Park in Utah, and that's a place that has over 2,000 natural natural stone arches. Um, arches National Park, 2,000 of them in this park, or 
hey, maybe this is a ruined city from a time ago because, oh, it just happened to erode all. Like, no, it's the statistical impossibility of these claims that they make and just the cognitive dissonance that people go along with it. It's mind boggling. And statistics is a good word. So let's look at this, this example where you see the feature in the background that's framed pretty much in the middle of that opening in the stone. Right? I mean, right, perfect. You, you, you see right where I'm middle. coming from yeah. with that? <laughs> well, oh, yeah. you have, the, you have um, the same thing going on at the Garden of the Gods in Colorado where you have it perfectly framed with the other features in the background. Um, this is a picture that I took when I was in Peru. I, I did make it to Amaru Muru. Yeah. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> um, but again, I was I was just starting to put this together. And when I saw that uh, at the Garden of the Gods in Colorado, I thought of that. That's amazing. And then um, this is in Washington State at the Olympic National Park, the hole in the wall at Rialto Beach. So you've got another perfect framing going on. And this is in, this is again in Kansas, the place in Kansas I just showed, Monument Rocks. Uh, this is Double Arch Trail in Kentucky. You know where it's, it's framing something like right in the center. And then I think I showed that already. These two I already showed. Um, and then once upon a time, the ley lines were actually on the maps. Yeah. So this is a Catalan atlas from about 1385 of the Mallorcan cartographic school. And um, so I've already said it, you know, we're, we're taught to believe all this is the result of natural and random processes. Um, but my belief is that it represents an intentional terraforming of the earth from ancient times by master builders to create harmony, beauty, and balance based on geometric principles. Um, okay. I can agree more. Yeah, I've been studying all of this for almost five years intensively. And um, so I've got a lot of knowledge that's just. You know, I, I may not remember exactly what I put on something, but I can know where I can go find it when I do the research for it. So this is the New York in cartographic school in southern France, um, the Balearic Islands in that area. And there's something really special going on there that we can only guess at what we're talking about, but Mallorca and that whole the islands off the um, coast of Spain, the Balearic Islands. Um, a lot to be found in all these places. But I want to start out with the example of the Palace of the Kings of Mallorca in Perpignan, France. I found this place on tracking and alignment. Um, you find that same framing going on. And I got a lot more examples. And just like how the architecture, all of these architectures, well, yes, they are man-made, and yes, they do align up with the solstices and the equinoxes. So how do these supposed natural uh, arches and uh, features also include these same alignments? It just, it's, it's preposterous. It's truly mind-blowing. So... You know, this is the example in France. Um, here's another example in Spain and Seville. So this is Gijon or Gijon in Spain, Seville, Spain, which is clearly Moorish architecture. Uh, more examples of that, the Alhambra in Granada, you've got the same, you know, perfect symmetry going on. Um, you have it going on in Ox at Oxford University in England with the archway framing the whole big building <laughs> perfectly. Right. Uh, like... You have it at, at Manners. You have the same thing going on. 
you know, this archway framing the gate. You have the Tower Bridge in London. Same thing. Much, much better chance that those supposed natural ones doing the same stuff are just the ruins of leftover original ones of what you're showing it, right here. Yeah, either that or intentional terraforming, you know, is probably or likely a combination of ruined infrastructure or, you know, it's meant to be there doing something. And again, we we don't have any concept of this original civilization, so we can just put puzzle pieces together to figure out what was going on. Um, but I've got more examples. You know, you've got the Eiffel Tower framed here by whatever this is, but it's another example here. You've got this um, military school framed by the archway of the Eiffel Tower. In Bavaria, you have you know, the archway framing these buildings here. And another example, this is also in the same place in Germany, Landshut. And then you have, this is one of my favorites here, the Fisherman's Bastion in Bud Budapest, Hungary. You've got this archway framing this building, but then you've got these archways perfectly framing the Hungarian parliament building in the background. Oh, wow. I mean, like perfectly. It's inception. And there inception it is again. Frame. <laughs> so um, this is in Vatican City. You can see St. Paul's Basilica through the archway. Um, you know, this archway in Italy on the Ulysses Riviera between Rome and Naples. You've got, you know, something going on there. This location at a monastery in Ethiopia. So you've got this at Jordan and Pet at Petra in Jordan. <laughs> it's the Treasury Building, and it's framed by an archway. And I that like, is a massive that, building. <laughs> that looks like the in between, almost like you know the missing uh, link right there, in between the natural and the man-made alignments. Right, and that's cut out of stone that location right like or it was all poured as geopolymer you know we don't know how they did it but what they left behind is just incredible um the blue mosque in isfahan iran same oh, phenomenon it's just so mind-bogglingly intense you have this mosque in abu dhabi in the united arab emirates it's just beautiful architecture it really um, is you know this is in oman muscato oman at a mosque this is the taj mahal in agra india um here's another one in this is in delhi india sorry I'm missing some pictures this is in the country of georgia and chechnya the original area. This is in China. Same idea. In Indonesia, this is before and after. Or there's, I did have a before and after picture of the, um, of this particular mosque in Banda Aceh, which got, you know, submerged by that tsunami, Boxing Day tsunami. Oh. But you've got the archway framing that perfectly. Um, this is off the coast of Brazil, on the island of. Fernando de Noronha, which is loaded with star forts. You know, you've got the same framing going on with the arch. Right, look at that. This is in Guadalajara, Mexico. This is Stanford University in California. <laughs> All right. Okay, this is uh, Jefferson Memorial in Gretna, Louisiana. So you've got the archway and then you've got the courthouse framed perfectly. This is Rollins College. This is, this is where my grandparents went to college, or where they met in Winter Park, Florida. That's the creation of Michelle right there. It's aligned. <laughs> Jeez. 
I guess. How do we do we pick our families or do they pick us? I don't know. All right. I think it's a little bit of both. <laughs> so um so anyway, like I said here, I don't know where this picture was taken, but there certainly appears to be a solar alignment occurring in the center of the arches. Uh, undeniable okay. solar alignment. So, I mean, when I talk about that kind of stuff, oh, let me sh let me uh, show you something else here real yeah. quick. Always. So before we started talking, um, I mentioned lighthouses with solar alignments. Um, I'm looking at your question. I am Kairos. Um, I, I've looked at San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge, and I know there's starports and lighthouses there. It's an interesting place. So I just wanted to share these alignments with lighthouses where you've got the same kind of phenomenon going on, and not just one lighthouse. I mean, this is not a case of at the right angle with the right cam with the camera. It's like this is consistently found. Um, right and over I and over and over again. And I absolutely believe there's a lot more going on with lighthouses than we're told. So there's that example, and you can look it up. I just typed in lighthouses with solar and lunar alignments. But even if you just type in lighthouses, you can find examples. Yeah, most images of the lighthouses at night have like the moon right over top of it every time. Right. right. And one more along those lines that I want to show you. You know, I've, I've talked about it at different places in my work, but not all in one place. Um, you've got the same thing going on with these Capitol buildings. Yes. You right. Know, so, so, you know, again, the point is this is not random. <laughs> exactly. Like this, this is built intentionally for this. Not alignment. random. <laughs> Which is and really the point that I wanted to make with those. The big door in the middle, and then the one in, on the left and the one on the right next to it, a little bit smaller. That's the um, solstice, the two equinoxes, and the solstice. And that's a, a astrological arch architectural alignment every single time in those buildings. Yeah. So, you know, again, when I talk about this civilization the way that I do, it's, it's just not like guessing it's like this is almost five years of looking at all these places and finding all this stuff and saying okay there's something to this <laughs> and um you know you know there's a war for our consciousness going on <laughs> we're in, right. we're in a war yeah. <laughs> a spiritual in war, war. And, you, know, <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> um <laughs> and we're you know people are waking up but you know, there's still a lot more to wake up. <laughs> exactly. They're trying to reset us every single day. That great reset they're trying to impose right now and indoctrinate every day through the schools, through the academies. And uh, it's you have to be aware yep. and you have to be self-educated. Right. And I, I see Sherry's comment about the lighthouse for sale. You find things like that. You find... Um, also find star right, yes, for sale <laughs> and get turned into hotels and things like that one day <laughs> i swear michelle maybe 10 years from now uh if we keep growing keep growing getting the word out there eventually we will have our own star fort island hotel getaway <laughs> where we will do trips with <laughs> ryan forrester and graham hancock and the rest it, it will be a good time I love your ambition, Bernie, but I don't know. <laughs> okay, one day at a time. I I would rather I would rather go on a world tour. <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. Of, of, these, of obscure places. I mean, we're not even talking about the well-known ones. We're talking about places oh, that know. you know used to have star forts, but there aren't there anymore. Um, there's a Cairo, Illinois, at the tip of Southern Illinois, where the the uh, Mississippi and Ohio rivers, you know, converge or canals. Let's call them canals. What they are. Yeah. And and the uh, there used to be a Fort Defiance there. Well, not anymore. You can see, go see the sign. Um, but I found star forts at these river confluences. Um, Pittsburgh has two, um, but not just on one continent. I found them in, in other places as well. 
know, whether there's a switch point, which it might have been, or a PowerPoint. Um, the, the patterns are there, and they don't even come close to matching what we're taught about them. Everything's random, you know, built for the French and Indian War or the War of 1812 or British fears of French invasion during the reign of Emperor Napoleon III, which is when a lot of the star forts in the British or English Channel were said to have been built. Right. In the Isle right. of Wight. Oh, um, these magical Napoleons. That's who built it all. Well, King Henry VIII has a couple attributed to him. Um, you know, there's a lot of cover stories going on, and I, I just I, there's a lot not to trust in the historical narrative. They've just given us garbage. It's so true, and, ca and called it truth, right? And it's like the hit, the victors write the history books. We all know that, and yet we believed them for so long you know and i just i have a hard time calling them the victor because they got it by deception and yeah cheating cataclysm cheating and, and they just destroying they i i think they caused a cataclysm and they just came in and they dug out enough infrastructure to restart civilization and rig the system to benefit themselves and um i think the 19th century was just horror for for humanity just absolute horrors um, yeah. between the asylums and you know the other things going on. I, I it was not a good time. Yeah, stealing all the kids from the parents and putting the parents into the asylums or into the wars, and then shipping the babies off to the other side of the realm. And yeah, I mean, they were doing something, um, either growing babies or you know, like with the infant poriums. Um, but I think it was more than that. Because uh, I think some of it was probably for repopulation and, and probably some of it was for harvesting, unfortunately. Yeah. But once again, that matrix is uh, the truth is stranger than fiction. Exactly. So Anyway, there's there's just so many aspects to what's taken place here, and had they had they had to have our consent, they could have just come in and taken everything over, right? Why did they do this? Why did they go through such an elaborate process to deceive us and to take control over our lives? Um, to mind control us through programming. Um, they did it because they have to have our consent. So the only way they can get our consent is to lie to us and have us agree to what they're doing. And because um, you know, really we're sovereign beings, really truly. And yes. as soon as we realize we have our, our power, they're done. So they've tried to convince us that they have that power over us. Right, to give up your own free will, your sovereignty between you and your creator. And as soon as you do that, you turn into a slave because you've given up your godly existence. And that's what we are to them. But we're, we became that because in reality, we're inextricably linked with our creator and that's what they want they want that want to that try spark. to convince us that their parasitical selves are uh the lord and creator and not the truth yeah not our own divine beings but but the other thing is when you start looking at a lot of this stuff closely in the historical record you know, without the internet, we wouldn't be able to go and do our own research. So they got away with it most of, you know, the last couple hundred years. But the the stories they tell us about how things came to existence are just ridiculous. <laughs> you know, it it doesn't add up. And um, and that's where critical thinking comes in. And that was removed from the school curriculum around 1851, 1852. It used to be a part of it. So. 
you know, this would probably be a good place to kind of segue a little bit into your area of expertise, Bernie, because we're talking about alchemy and, you know, ways of working with the elements that, you know, we can't even begin to speculate on um, because we're not given all the information that we need. You know, and we're told that alchemists were medieval scientists trying to turn base metals into gold. And right. um, I, I went through a little part at the end of the video I put up last night about um, the periodic table of the elements. And I also mentioned, mentioned Walter Russell's and a couple of other things. And I know you know a lot about that kind of stuff. So why don't you go ahead? All right, I will just have to switch it over here. And yes, it, um, the alchemy and Walter Russell, it shows that geometry has so much more to do with the structure of our realm and the universe, that there's these symmetries in the octaves and in the platonic solids here that take shape and... Uh, the alchemical symbols are, in fact, far advanced, uh, lost uh, technology. And that uh, when you look at alchemy symbols like this, uh, those are also electrical, electromagnetic uh, symbols. And that, in fact, we there's this universal language in, of energy, of structure, and of the alchemists that we were convinced to scoff at and to ridicule and that it was nothing, but in fact, it actually looks like it is the building blocks of reality. And uh, it just, it's, it's crazy that they, they they say that the alchemists were responsible for discovering chemistry, discover or inventing like alcohols, inventing medicines, pharmaceuticals, essentially, and uh, everything where uh, that part is correct. But then they've convinced us all that, oh, they've made all these crazy discoveries, but they're absolutely... Um, you know, bonkers out of their mind. Oh, thank you so much for the support, Colleen. Um, super sticker, $12. Uh, and that what they have done is removed the spiritual side of alchemy that connected the metaphysical realm with the physical realm and made this science of the west the science of uh today of academia completely physical and completely inept and retarded to the grander conscious universe and creation that is everything and that uh in the east like eastern alchemy eastern philosophy eastern medicine they still uh, include all of these different esoteric and metaphysics uh, aspects and energies and sciences into their practices, into their society, into their understanding, and into their daily lives. And it's because they haven't lost that original touch uh, and connection with it uh, through this alchemy. Yeah, I mean, there's so much that, it, you know, when we're kind of taught to believe that, you know, it's just us, <laughs> we're, we're, we're finite, we're not connected to other things. Um, I have come along a lot more to a flat earth model because of information I found. I didn't start there, but I have to be honest, my, my passion is this original civilization and the earth grids. That's what drives my work. And so I'm a lot more comfortable with that whole model. Um, because if the if we're not a spinning ball, then everything's spinning around us. <laughs> you know, so it's like, okay, I got that. The tree of life and all of that kind of thing. So um you know, I'm just giving that as an example of 
the kinds of things that have polarized our existence because of misinformation and disinformation deliberately done. And so where I'm going with that is we are all connected. We're all connected to everything. So how is that possible? And, you know, based on everything we've been taught, it's, it's not. <laughs> you know, we're just a collection of chemical reactions um, but I think there's a lot more to those chemical reactions that connect us to source and everything else. Um, and we have a hard time seeing that uh, we're not just, you know, we're more than what we think we are. You know, we're multidimensional beings. Absolutely. And, and we live in a holographic universe. So how, how does that work? How does that happen? right a hundred percent like that the holograph the holographic universe like is it this matrix dimension this fractal matrix dimension of the multiverse of dimensions that uh we do exist in and that consciousness exists in and is formed in and out of and there's just so much more to it Right. And, and when I first started doing my own research, um, it was kind of a little bit from the spiritual side, I guess you could say, in a way. You know, I mentioned at the very beginning, I learned about sacred geometry. And around the same time I was learning about that, I was reading Greg Braden's work, and he talks about um, the holographic universe and a lot of the spiritual side of things and how the truth is found in ancient texts. Um, for those of of you who are familiar with Marco Rodin, Marco Rodin. Oh yes, oil. absolutely. So his discovery he found in the Baha'i sacred texts. Um, it's just, you know, it's it's there. <laughs> um, and it, it sure looks like with the historical narrative studies that I've done is that everything kind of started coming in all the new early modern stuff started coming in around 1450, 1500. Um, and that's what we're told. Now, at what point history come becomes real? I'm not really sure, <laughs> but I think there's a whole lot of backfill where they kind of constructed a new history based loosely on real people <laughs> right it's like exactly especially like that napoleon one two three four five six seven eight like oh god like you no I, I i really don't think that's that's how it was right again with everything i've gone over i i do not see a worldwide civilization that was at war with each other I'm not seeing that, nor am I seeing the harmonic building people. They were building bridges. They were building pyramids. They were not attacking, destroying each other. Right. And, and nor am I seeing lots of little resets. I'm seeing one massive reset. And, you know, again, I, it's just, it's a continuous, integrated civilization from what would be considered modern to what would be considered relatively recent or ancient to what would be considered relatively modern and then they flipped everything on its head with their reset so kind of like this mandela effect may be like this uh shimmer of the original uh, inflection point that uh, they came in and that catastrophized everything not that long ago at all. Yeah, and I mean, I'm I'm open to fallen angels and you know other beings that you know the idea of paradise lost being predictive programming and telling us what they did. Um, and I've been doing some research along those lines. Something major happened and it it they got into everything they're still in everything which i think is why it's taking taking them so long to be held accountable because <laughs> they don't want to get caught they don't want to get caught 
you know, they'll double down on their lies. <laughs> right. And accountability is key. And that for everyone out there, you have to be accountable first with yourselves, with your family, your friends, and the world. And it's the only way for us to have an honest future and uh, an honest life. And that uh, that is how we will beat these parasites is by being honest and accountable and uh, coming forward with the truth and figuring out the past to build a better future. Right. As much as possible, speaking your truth, because, you know, I can't even talk about this stuff with my family. I mean, they're pretty programmed and most of the people I know aren't ready for this yet, which is a nice thing about a online cyber community because it seems like people, um, you know, find, find, information like this when they're ready and you can't just tell somebody this if they're not there right like they uh if you have if someone is not ready to wake up they will resist it at all costs and in fact you'll oftentimes you'll create division within your own family just trying to enlighten or what you think saves them with the truth and it's that people have to be able and ready to wake up on their own and that you have to uh discuss it with those that are are awake and ready and just put the information out there for your loved ones when they are ready, but don't try to force it on anyone when they're not. Yeah, it's a non-starter <laughs> and, and could actually be more damaging than, than helpful. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I, um, I, I, you know, I would call myself pretty open-minded and I had to process through a lot of things that I heard say 10 years ago that I'm like, well, okay, well, all right, you know, David Icke's stuff. But I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, but it took right. me, it took me a number of years to get to the point where I could see it and understand it. And then when I first heard it, it's like, oh, that kind of sounds a little out there. But I'm not saying it's not, I'm just saying, I'm not ready to embrace that yet. And and now I just know that um, the, the evil is far worse than we can even imagine. I mean, I know a lot of stuff, and I know I don't know a lot of the the really ugly, dirty stuff. But I know it's there. Right. You know, the stuff, the like, stuff that we don't talk about. And <laughs> It needs to eventually be exposed and come out and dealt with, but at the same time, until that time is ready, you just can't get into it or you get stuck in the depressing aspects of it and the horridness of it. It's like traumatize yourself with it that, you know, it, it will come out, it will be dealt with, but uh, we'll leave that to the professionals and the actual um you know, people that uh, will deal with it. Right. And there's a lot of other people on YouTube that do. <laughs> you know, so it's like, not my thing. And but, and Odyssey but it's, and but it's and not Odyssey. putting my head in the sand and, and not wanting to acknowledge it. It's like, I'll leave that for somebody else because this is this is my thing, what I've been talking exactly. about. Exactly. And still always listen to it to know that it's out there, but just won't focus on it. Right. Right. But we're living in an exciting time. Um, I, I'm personally very optimistic um, that we're watching things play out and that God wins and that um, we get front row seats to <laughs> the hero's journey being successful but with us being the hero, humanity, yeah, the, crea the creator through humanity, the phoenix. Right. You know, however Phoenix you want to, how you want to call it, you know, that there's kind of a, a death process before a rebirth process. And part of that, I think, is kind of dying to what we thought we knew. Um, and, you know, it gets, I, I wish that the world I thought I was growing up in, and I'll be 60 this summer, I wish that was, you know, what it was. 
but we're living at that time where it's becoming clearer and clearer that something's really wrong what's going on right now something is really wrong and upside down and we're being gaslighted and all this other stuff with what's going on in the news what's going on around the world um that something is horribly wrong and and that's the nice thing about being a truther now is that it's it's no longer you know out there as much as the conspiracy theory and the um the can start to can start to see what's what's going on in front of them and right. i think that's part of the great because i think that i think the controllers thought that we wouldn't wake up and that people would believe continue to believe the lies but when they start pushing these crazy agendas on everybody and misrepresenting information you know things that have happened even this last week you know or big problems that things aren't that aren't getting yeah, addressed yeah yeah very know, good point um you know chemical releases you know things like that that are um that aren't being dealt with that are being ignored um something's wrong and it's because there's a non-human anti-human agenda in play or playing out <laughs> you know right so that, yeah exactly that will influence every single time trying to get us to divide and conquer each other over and over and over as much as possible right you know just tell the same lie over and over and over again and that's going to be their undoing because now it's quite obvious that um i'm, I'm thinking of events of the last couple of days um that what they're trying to push <laughs> In, in the narrative is back you know, ridiculous it's so <laughs> fast, fast, fast it's backwards like uh, how how <laughs> like I'm, I'm talking about the tg stuff that's going on right now right the oh, days, yeah. in the news yeah. you know so there's just a lot of stuff that's coming out that and i think this is part of the great awakening awakening that normal people are finally going to say wait a minute <laughs> what's going on <laughs> and it's, it's just it's happening more and more every day just every single day the stories that they come out with they're more and more unbelievable further from reality uh, more of this clown world this backwards ass reality that just doesn't make sense and it's it is it's their undoing a hundred percent right because it finally gets pretty clear um there's the the rules for radicals um i can't think of the name of the <laughs> the figure my, my brain's not working um but anyway there's there's this playbook that they use but that's their only playbook <laughs> and they've been very effective with it up to a certain point but now that they've lost control of the narrative you know it is starting to fall apart right they just have that one play alinsky Stephanie. alinsky that's it saul alinsky rules for radicals that's their one playbook and beyond that they're lost because they don't understand us they don't understand love um and they they just don't understand us and they just want to control us and you know, get what they can from us. Right, they want to suck that energy out, but no more energy for the parasites. Put your energy into building a better new reality for you, your loved ones, and the future of all humanity. Right. So um, Paul was not able to join us tonight. There's something that came up. And so we're going to reschedule with Paul next week. Exactly, and, and it's hard to find a time that um, works for all four of us. Given we've got one in Australia, two in North America, and one in in England, yeah, so it. yeah. it's, it's a bit it's a bit challenging to find the right time for the four of us. But we're going to work on it. Absolutely, because there's a lot of synergies with um, my work and Paul's work. Yeah, and we will bring that together. This time next week, one week from right now. And we did a pretty good episode today, uh, Michelle. I'm glad that uh, you're like, no, no, we're still doing it because that was quite the presentation. It was awesome. 
Uh, anything else you want to uh, cover before we uh, wrap this one up? Or are we good for uh, today? Oh, hello. The, this is just the tip of a t the iceberg of a really big subject. And, you know, anybody that's motivated to start looking around your community or follow your own passion, you know, we can use you. <laughs> um, it's not hard. If I can do this, anybody can do this. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I never blogged in my life until 2018. And I I put out, I was going to put out one video and somebody subscribed and I thought, well, geez, I need to make videos now. And so I found the easiest video making program that I could find and started to turn my blog post into videos. And I'd never done it before. And um, I just felt like it was important to get this inform out, information out any way possible. And I've been doing it for almost five years. Right. And it's turned into a whole new life of amazingness. And that we need the boots on the ground of wherever you are. If you're by a star fort, you're by a castle, you're by a megalith, a dolom, a glacial erratic even. Just take a, a little video with your camera and, or your cell phone and upload it to your YouTube channel and share. And Or like Michelle's saying, create a little blog post. It's both a self-bettering fulfillment that uh, you'll feel yourself in achieving it when you do it each time. And you're helping build the evidence for all of the community. Um, I am Kairos. Um... I would, if you haven't seen my last two videos on that subject of finding mining and mineral occurrences on alignments, I would say at least watch those. And I, my area of expertise is not the actual mechanics of it. Um, mine seems to be grid lines and, and, and maybe being able to see the bigger picture just because of my, my unique life experiences. I mean, I was one of my first experiences. I was about six years old, and my dad practiced softball. Uh, there was a church softball team, and there was an elementary school next to the church where the team would practice. I wasn't interested in that, so I ran off down into the woods next to the field. And my memory from that is that there were these big, gigantic blocks of stone down there that were pretty cool to play with around, you know, didn't think anything of it until I started doing this work. And then realizing that the home that I lived on um, between the ages of probably 11 and 19 was right next to a golf course on top of what I now see as a, a flat top pyramid. Um, so cool. My family's home was on the, um, the flatter end of it, but all the neighbors' houses, there was a bend, and they had really steep slopes for their backyards. We actually had like a flat front yard and backyard. Um, but it looked like a flat top pyramid. And then the elementary school I went to was right next to where we lived. And there were earth earthworks all over that too. So it's like, um, I was around all this stuff growing up and you know who knows maybe i got an extra dose of energy for my bedroom or something like that i don't know yeah did. Um, <laughs> but it's it's like things like that where i kind of started filing things in the back of my head and then when i i went to england in 2010 i was living in fairbanks at the time and i went with another lady who wasn't awake um we had two different experiences traveling together um, but we went to where my mother's family was from on in a little town called Bradford on Avon. And I had learned about the flower of life just a couple of years before that, but I still was just kind of starting to wake up to a lot of this stuff. And I went to this one building that I knew about from family records called the Threshing Barn. And so I just kind of went there experienced it and on my way out I looked to my left and there was a flower of life carved into the stone and I don't even think it was a complete flower of life I just remember really? seeing it and I, I had only learned about the flower of life like 
a year or two before that. So, um, you know, those seem to be the, it, it just, that's why it feels like it's part of my journey, my, my spiritual path or whatever, um, because from a young age, I just started noticing things that were out of place. I, I'm very similar myself with that. And um, with the pyramids, the flat top pyramids too, I'm going to be going to Drum Heller in a couple of months here. World famous Badlands, uh, the dinosaur or dragons, the bones throughout uh, the Royal Torrell Museum. But what I have figured out and I'm 99.9999% sure is that in the backyards of the towns of uh, Drumheller, pretty much every third yard has these flat top pyramids with alternating layers of uh, charcoal, red sand, yellow sand, charcoal back and forth. And, you know, this whole town could be a lost pyramid city. And, and that is repeated over and over and over and over and over right, exactly. i mean i've i saw it in oklahoma city you know i've seen it in other places as well these these neighborhoods have perfectly rounded earthworks for their front yards or backyards or whatever um you know i saw that with my brother's house in oklahoma that i when i started to wake up to this when i was living there i I'm like wait a minute <laughs> you really don't have to go far and um, it's just, once you wake up to it, like we said earlier, you can't not see it. Right, it's exactly. And it's like, well, you better be prepared for it because once you, your mind is open, you see it, you see it everywhere. And it is literally everywhere. And uh, we'll have to do an episode also on connecting more into the Montana uh, geo or megaliths and uh geoglyphs that uh i've been uh they connect with the alberta ones obviously but uh that there's more and more information coming out about these it, montana ones and their alignments too and, and i could just say the ley lines are huge they're, they're just huge information and i believe it's a form of consciousness um maybe our consciousness <laughs> maybe God right, yeah. us. I mean there's there's something truly important and magical about these these ley lines there was a, a lot connected to it and why they build their cathedrals on them and their palaces on them and the chakras and the crown chakra and then the crowns that they wear up on their um, pedestals on their um uh, the thrones and whatnot that are where these ley lines intersect so are is this advanced technology of mind control even that uh, the rulers might have once had i think what they did i think what they did was they reverse engineered the grid system to become a control system instead of benefiting all life everywhere i think that's what they did they just right? you know these beautiful schools, whether elementary schools or high schools or colleges, you know, that are really are ornate, um, became schools, banks, um, museums, um, they were turned into control systems. Whereas before it was all part of this free energy grid generating system. Free energy grid and energy generating system. All right, and we we need to get back to that because it's just too expensive. Uh, West San, I think it's L E Y, not L A Y. Yeah, L E Y. Yes, they It's no. L E Y. Well, appreciate being on, Burn I Okay, and everybody being here today. Thank you absolutely so we will wrap this one up at uh just over an hour and a half here we will definitely be back next week with paul he does apologize that he wasn't able to make it uh last week when we were supposed to do it you had to rebook so this week he mm -hmm. had something come up so next week it will will happen 100 
And this was still a very excellent episode. Thank you so much for your time, Michelle, and for everyone being here. Uh, we love you all, and we will catch you on the next one. And go subscribe to Michelle if you haven't already. Ta-ta. <laughs>